All right. Good morning. Good morning. As we were going through our prayer list, um, and since Ruth Williams isn't here this morning, I thought of sharing a joke uh, that I heard from Ethelgard Smith um, back in the fall when I got to hear him talk. Um, since we don't have Ruth with us, we are a little bit ruthless this morning. <laughs> However, we are studying the book of Ruth this morning. Uh, we, we are no longer in that ruthless book, Joshua, um, that uh, we had been studying in. But um, before we get into Ruth, I want us to spend some time taking a step back and looking at, again, the greater picture of what's happening. We, we have had this... Uh, this conquest that Joshua has described time and time and they're seeing the works of God and yet they're have, there's still those bits of them that are saying what is going on we don't understand what's happening but I, I want us to take an even further step back into an area we're a little bit more comfortable in uh, the New Testament and so if you would like I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 1 verses 2 through 6 now Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And Perez was the father of Hezron, and the Hezron was the father of Ram. And Ram was the father of Abinadab, and Abinadab was the father of Nashon. And Nashon was the father of Salmon, and Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David, the king. And then jumping down to verse 16, And Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, and who is called Christ. I want us to take a step back, and as we've seen some of these characters already in our study, we've seen Rahab, we've seen, and now we are about to see Naomi and Ruth. And Boaz will come in probably next, well, not probably next week, he'll come in next week. But we're, we're seeing these characters, and for some, the book of Ruth seems like an oddity. Why is it here? Why, why do we have this story of, this, of Ruth? It, it, it doesn't make sense. It, as we'll read this morning, she, she's a Moabite. Why is a Moabite important to the story of Israel? Why is she important to the story of God's people? And it's not really revealed, because sure there is a short revelation at the end of chapter 4 where we get a revel uh, not a revel uh, a genealogy that leads us to the, uh, the line of David. It, it's that part of the genealogy that's in Matthew 2 uh, through 6. And it gets us to King David. Well, sure, that's important, but why is that? There's even more importance when we take a step back and realize... Well, the Messiah is of this line of David. And not only is the Messiah of this line, this line of David is not a perfect line. We, we could spend months and years going through just each of these individuals that we've read off and seeing all of their flaws and how we compare to them. And sometimes we do less sin than they did. And yet they're in this line of David. They're in the line of Jesus Christ. And especially when you start to even think about it more sure Rahab and was a prostitute and she's also a Canaanite Gentile well Ruth is also a, a, a Moabite and she's a Gentile and she's outside and so she is sinful by nature she is not one of God's people why is she there well Ruth is probably a better example of what a godly person looks like than any of these other characters well, Abraham is a lying uh, individual. He passes off his wife as his sister twice, uh, and he teaches his son to do that, um, whether knowingly or not, because Isaac does the same thing, and you have this, uh, all these stories of all these flaws in these men, and yet Ruth has this story in which we see truly what it means to be a godly individual. So if you will, uh, turn over to, with me to Ruth chapter 1. <laughs> And I'll read from verses 1 through 5 just to get us started. In the days of the, when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn to the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of their two sons was Malon and Chilion. 
they were Ephraites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and when she, and she was left with two sons. These took Moabite wives, their names of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there for about ten years. And both Malon and Chilion died, and the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Now this is a weird introduction uh, to the book of Ruth, at least for an Israelite audience. It's not starting off great. It's not a good story to hear. If anything, as an Israelite, you're hearing it, and it's a terrible story. Here is a member of the tribe of Judah, and one of our best, our, our best and our brightest, our strongest warriors, and yet he is deciding to reject everything we just went through in Joshua. He is deciding, you know what, instead of living in the promised land where God has promised us to be, where God is giving us protection, where we have spent generations fighting for this land, I'm going to go live amongst the enemies. Because in the time of the judges, not only do we have the cycle of disobedience and obedience that causes some of these famines, as the book of Judges says, but Moab is one of the main enemies that keeps rising up against the kingdom of Israel. Or, I guess it's not kingdom yet. The people of Israel have several times in which I think there's at least three stories of judges that have to go up against kings of Moab because Moab and the Moabites are seeking to destroy the tribes of Israel. And so the story of Ruth is, wait, one of our best and our brightest are rejecting us to go live with the enemy. And not only that is, we can jump into Deuteronomy, Moses says anyone who associates with the Moabites are cursed, let alone anyone who takes Moabite wives are cursed. And so not only are they a rejecting Israel and all that we've been promised, they're embracing curses that Moses has said, the people will be cursed by. You are taking Moabite wives. You are taking on this shame. And yet, we know that's not how the story ends. But at first, this has to be a terrible introduction for, yes, let's get an Israelite audience to read this book. Now, it's not in the same time. We know it's at least at, during the time of David because, of course, at the end of the book, we have the genealogy of David. And so, it's one of those, surely there's still that historian or someone who knows the history and has to think, this is a terrible story. Why, why are we telling this, this story about this deserter at the beginning of this story? Well, it gets us to where we're, we're it gets us to our main characters. And it gets us to, the, under, to um, it gets us to know who Ruth is. Now, unknown to, uh, the readers, they don't, un uh, we're seeing the line goes down and we get to the point in which Ruth will be one of the ancestors of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And time and time again, we've seen some of these patterns, right? Of there's, in the view of if you're a strict literalist of the law of Israel, and if you're taking the Torah literally, there is no room for mistakes. It's black and white. You're either cursed or you're blessed. Well, over and over again, the story of Christ keeps pointing us back to he's taking on these curses. He's taking on the curses of, well, you have Moabite descendants. Well, Moabites, uh, your line is supposed to be cursed, but it's not. Because it's glorified because of who God is. But it's taking on that curse for the, the other people. It's taking on these shameful acts in Joshua. Of, well, he's dying like these foreign kings. These Canaanite kings are being hung on trees and then thrown in caves with a round stone rolled in front. That's not a dignified way of dying. I don't think anyone would consider it a dignified way of dying, and yet that's how our Messiah has chosen to die. But uh, this section ends with, well, we were introduced to these men, and they're all gone. It's just the women now. And so we, we pick up in chapter, uh, not chapter 6, verse 6, and it reads this. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law and returned to the country of Mo uh, to return from the country of Moab. She had heard of the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited the people and had given them food. So she set from that place where she was with her two daughters-in-laws, and they went on and they returned 
to the land of, uh, sorry, I am jumping all around. She was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to, your, her, to her, her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and lifted up their voices, and they lifted up their voices and wept. But they said to her, No, we will return with you and to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I sent your sons in the womb? No, I have I yet have sons in my womb. That they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should be have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you then wait for them to be grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the, Lord, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. I'm going to pause right there. Ruth gives us a, a whole lot of information about, or at least not a whole lot of information. It, it gives us kind of an outline of a lot of these cultural aspects of what was going on at the time. One is this idea of what is a woman who has been widowed supposed to do in the, in the land of Israel or even in Moab? Well, they're supposed to return to their, to their homeland, to their parents. Um, and it even kind of continues on. Uh, some of these continue on into uh, more European history as we see with some of our kings and queens over there. And of course, I say our, but it's not really ours because we have a president and we fought a revolution and won. Um, and so we don't have to worry about the kings anymore. Um, but in some of the monarchies, you still see some of these patterns as well of if you have someone who's betrothed and the king dies, well, it's up to the parents whether should we continue this pattern of no, you need to wait until you have um, until the next son is ready to be married. We see this with Catherine of Aragon. She was wed to Henry VIII's older brother, and but Henry VIII's older brother dies, and so it becomes Henry VIII's first wife. Um, he has six more, and it's so not six more, five more, and uh, we we can all sing the song we learned back in high school of what happens to King Henry's wives. But it's one of those times in which we see kind of this pattern is, still, is present in the biblical narrative. This idea of, well, there's really two things a, someone, a woman who is betrothed to a man is to do. She's either supposed to wait for the next child or next son to be born, and that's who she is to marry when he comes of age, or she is to return to her parents' house so that she may be married off again. We kind of even see this in the New Testament. When Matthew, not Matthew, when Joseph is struggling with what to do with Mary. Mary has become pregnant, and it's not by him. Well, they're not married yet, and he's still struggling with this idea of, what am I to do with this woman? Because surely there has to be some part of him that thinks, well, sure, it was the Holy Spirit that uh, impregnated you, Mary. Um, that's a great story. Um, but... Uh, it's one of those moments of, you, you see it in Luke, and I, you kind of see it in Matthew, of this inner debate of, should I return her to her parents and get my money back, the dowry that I paid um, so I could marry her? I, can I get that money back? Is there some way I can exchange this? And so the same thing would happen again. Here is, well, the, the husbands have died. There's no wealth for you to be returned but if you're young enough, if you have not bear, born children of these husbands, if you return to your house, maybe you will be married to someone who can take care of you. Maybe you will be married off to some man who, of Moabite descendants, and it, we won't have to worry about this intermarriage of Moabite and Israelites anymore. And then we pick up where after I kind of stopped, and Naomi gave this explanation, and at first, both are sitting there like, no, we're not going to leave some widowed old woman to make this journey through the wilderness back to Judah by herself. That seems outrageous. And then 
as we pick up in verse 15, or believes, or I guess it's verse 14, or believes. And she's still emotionally distraught, but I'm sure she's sitting there thinking, you know what, Naomi, you're right. There is nothing really for me here. There, there is no reason I should hold on to this relationship because you're right, you're not one of my kinsmen. You're not, you, you don't worship the same gods I worship. You, you, you may have been the mother of my now dead husband, but you're not having another son, so why, why should I stick around? And so Orpah believes. But what we see is Ruth clings on. She, she is holding on to Naomi. And I started to think about this, and you can say I'm wrong or whatever, but it, oh well. Uh, what I think is happening here is so much of what we see, even today, in, in some of these refugee crises, right? Where people are clinging on to life rafts, or they're doing almost illogical things. You understand an inflatable tube is not going to be a, a seaworthy vessel to get you out of your war-torn country and go across the Mediterranean, right? Uh, these floaties are meant to last in maybe a year in a, a swimming pool. It's not supposed to take you across the sea. And you, you see multiple people clinging onto these rafts, these inflatable inner tubes, whatever we want to call them. We see people trying to climb onto trains and hold onto the sides of trains or planes or automobiles or whatever, just trying to escape. You have the stories of people uh, fleeing from North Korea who will hijack cars and rush it across a, a militarized border where the, the guards are ordered to shoot anything that moves just so that they might get to South Korea and have freedom. We, we see some of the same idea. I think we can even argue that this is kind of what Ruth is doing in her, her desire to, to seek out God. She's recognized something in Naomi. Naomi is a Israelite. She worships the God of Israel. And she is not ready. She recognizes this God of Israel is not like the Moabite gods. It's not like how this God of Israel has given a law to the people of Israel that is completely different than the law that the Moabites say came from their gods. The Moabites are malicious animals in contrast to the Israelites. They're, they're wicked. They're, they have no concern for some of the same dignities of life. They, they do horrible things. They will commit child sacrifices. They will uh, do BC, have bestiality. They'll be terrible. They'll, they are at war within themselves because they are depraved and fallen. Ni Ruth is sitting there and realizing this God that Naomi follows is different, though. Sure, it's not my family. Sure, I'm not going to probably see my family ever again. Sure, it's not what I am used to. But I'm sitting here, she is sitting there and recognizing this is my way out. This is my ticket to live amongst godly people. Live against morally upright people. Live again among, with people who fear the Lord and follow the law of the Lord. Now, not everyone in Israel at the time is following the law of the Lord. That's why there was a famine. The, the cycle in Judges is pretty clear. They start off following God, and then they fall away because, well, we want to do our own thing. God, sorry, we're, we're going to do our own thing. So God sends a famine, or war, or some pestilence, or something that's going to knock them out of their, uh, knock them up on the side of their head, saying, hey, you're, you're doing wrong. And then you get the moment of, okay, now we're going to return to God, because you're right, God, this is terrible. And so God will send a judge, and then they, the people would come godly, law-following individuals, and yet they will eventually fall back into that spot of we don't, why do we need to follow God? God, what has he done for us? He's delivered you so many times. He's given you a law so many times. But the people will still fall into that well, God tells me what to do. I, I want to do my own thing. I want to do what I think is right. But in this moment, Naomi's not in any of those stages. She's recognizing, did I say Naomi or Ruth? You said Naomi. Okay, I, I meant Ruth. Ruth is sitting there and saying, I know that what I have is bad. 
I need to follow God. I'm going to reject my people. The, the, the story opens with an Israelite rejecting his ways to go live amongst the Moabites. But now we have a Moabite rejecting the ways that she's been brought up in to follow God. And the story continues. I'm going to jump down to verse, uh, to kind of the end, which um, I wasn't expecting this to go as quickly as it is. But uh, in verse 19, the section kind of ends. And so the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women amongst the town said, Is this Naomi? And Naomi said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me? And the Almighty has brought, up calam brought calamity upon me. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, I, mentioned, I meant to mention this before, because it's kind of one of those ironies. Bethlehem is the house of bread, right? At least that's what it literally translates to. And at the beginning, there is a famine to where the house of bread has no food. And so it's one of those moments of, we, we have this weird period of the house of bread has no food, but on, upon return of Naomi and Ruth, it is the beginning of harvest. There is a hope for this land. It is no longer stricken by a drought or famine. Now there is hope in the land, and something is about to happen. Something, a, a turning of the corner has happened. But we, we haven't really been told about it yet. But it is interesting. Uh, Ruth is holding on to Naomi. She is saying, this is who I need to learn who to, how to follow God from. But Naomi is not happy with God. She's sitting there and saying, God has taken everything away from me. There is no goodness here. He has, put, he has taken everything that used to fill me with joy and gladness. Why, why she's having her crisis of faith. Why should I follow God? God, is, God has done nothing but poor things to me recently. And so it's interesting that even in those times of bitterness... Others are still recognizing something's different about us, right? In, in those moments in which, sure, we've been dealt a terrible hand. We've gone through the ups and downs, and we've been being down, and we feel like God has been turned against us. As a godly individual, we can still sit there and re if we step back and realize we are still acting different than how the world would act when something like this happens. If we had no hope in God, we, we wouldn't blame it on God. We would blame it on everyone else around us. It is this person's fault. Steve is the reason why this happened. Jim is the reason why this happened. I, I need to cut off Steve. I need to cut off Jim. They're the ones who are doing me wrong. Well, no, it's whatever you're doing. You did this evil thing, and so you're facing the consequences of your actions. But Naomi is saying, it's God. God has done something to us. But she doesn't cut off God. She doesn't reject God. She just doesn't know what to do. She is struggling with bitterness in her heart. But as the, the, the chapter ends, we, we do get this idea of there is hope on the horizon. And if we really want to talk about it, Naomi is not coming back empty. She just doesn't know what she has yet. She doesn't... We'll see it next week in chapter 2. Ruth is the means in which she is redeemed. Ruth, her daughter-in-law, this person who she's probably sitting there thinking, great, we're going to be a beggar. And now I have to... We, we're going to be two beggars, and we're going to be widowed women, and that's two miles to feed instead of just one. And so uh, we're going to be struggling even more how, how is this a good thing? God, you have tied me to a, 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 this weight around my ankles. It's going to be harder for me to carry this on. You've given me a burden. 
But Ruth isn't a burden for Naomi. Ruth is the means by which Naomi will be blessed once again. Now, I've talked a lot, and I feel like I've sped through that. Is there anything that you guys notice in this chapter that you want to bring up? Oh, we have multiple hands. In the same, like, line. Go for it. Ladies first. Thank you. Uh, I was just thinking when I read this, she said uh, to go back to your God. Mm -hmm. You would think she wouldn't have said that. She said, just go back to your people. Just go back to your God. Mm -hmm. And... But there had to be something really good between Naomi and Ruth. Because mother-in-law and daughter-in-law don't always get along. No. And so if you have a close enough relationship that you respect or you love or you care about them, you're going to go with them. So it could have been totally different, a different situation. Sure. But, uh, you know, just thinking of that. <clears throat> yeah. Another thing is dealing with women did all the work of moving the camp and all that. And the girls were basically, you know, okay, go get some money for them. Mm. So we don't know about Ruth where she came up, but for Naomi, she may have been a closer bond with Naomi than she had with her own. Mm. We don't know how long she was with Naomi. It said that uh, they were married 10 years. It doesn't say how long, you know, sure. her husband lost on that marriage, you know, how long they've been married. So, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good point. Because um, both of y'all kind of made a point of this idea of there, there has to be something here that's different than the bond Ruth has with her own folks, right? Her own kinsmen, uh, or her. Uh, that's compelling her to realize not only is Naomi's God better than my God's, it's Naomi's way of life, Naomi's relationship with others is better than how my people treat each other. Um, Jeb. Uh, at verse 20, it says, don't call me Naomi, she told them, call me Mara. Naomi means pleasant and Mara means bitter. So she had really, really is deeply, uh, I don't know if you'd say offended, but is deeply uh, unhappy with where she finds herself. She's no longer pleasant. I am now bitter. And bitter is a very uh, egregious place to be. Yes. It, it's, that is an interesting point because, uh, and it kind of explains it here. But so often we, we just read someone's name in the Old Testament and we're like, oh yeah, that's just their name. There's no meaning behind it whatsoever. Well, even in English, some of our names have <coughs> meanings behind them. There's, it's describing something or at one time may have been describing something. But it's one of those, in the Old Testament, every name means something. And so... Well, Jesus had how many names, <laughs> as he's referenced? Like Emmanuel, uh, Yeshua, like we can just run down the list of how many names Jesus was given. Well, he's in the same culture just hundreds of years later. It's the same idea of it is significant that an Israelite changes their names. Well, it's well, even jumping back into Genesis, it is extremely significant when God changes your name. And God changes a few individuals' names back in Genesis with Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, uh, Jacob to Israel. It's one of those, this change signifies something internally for them. And so Naomi to say, I am no longer pleasant. I am no longer joyful. I am bitter. It has to be, it's not just she's feeling bitter that day. She is feeling something internally changing within her. I have no more joy. I have nothing but bitterness. Well, she lost her husband and both of her sons. So yep. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, I'm not saying it's not unreasonable. She, had, and to, to her understanding, she has lost everything. And what does she have to show for it? Some daughter-in-law that came with her. Like, it's one of those moments of she is struggling with this fact. 
And no more does she find joy in herself. She will find joy if later on she changes her name back. But it, I, 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 it is important to bring up that idea of name change um, here. Well, you said that Naomi felt like Ruth was just kind of a burden. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to have to disagree because two are always better than one. She, if she, they both may have been ladies, which a man had to take care of them then. But two are better than one, and the Lord tells us that. And she had somebody to go with her and be with sure. her. Sure. And it's not. I wasn't necessarily saying that it's bad that two people are together, or that, that she doesn't have someone there. But it is one of those, if we start getting granular about what the, their context would have really been, they would have been widows, they would have been beggars, no, they're not to have jobs, they have to sit there and <coughs> hope that someone takes kindness of them, and <coughs> instead of having one mouth to feed, they have to feed two people. And, and it's, not saying, it's not in that moment saying she hates Ruth, and that Ruth came along. It's just that frustration of, well great, I now have more people to feed, and we have just as little of resources as we did before. Because Ruth is not bringing over a 401k or a retirement plan. <laughs> She's not bringing home, how, home uh, her savings from uh, Moab. She, she just has what she has. Like her, She herself did not have uh, wealth. Her wealth was with her, her husband, who was Naomi's son, who's dead. So whatever they have, Naomi probably has, and sitting there and thinking, well, this may last us a couple months, and then we are... But they had nothing together, like, yeah. my, if me and my daughter, you know, and I, I felt Ruth kind of considered Naomi her mother. Oh, no she, doubt. Yeah. yeah. But I saw two hands, though, or three. I was just going to say, it's amazing <laughs> to me that God knows our names. Yes. I mean, trillions of people. He knows our name today. Mm -hmm. I think one of the best, the prettiest scriptures in the Bible is what Ruth replied. Mm -hmm. Your God will be my God. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is something that stays with people. I mean, you may not remember much about Ruth, but you remember that part because it's always said in weddings and it's saying, which doesn't mean the same thing, but it does kind of. But kind of. it was mentioned for, for the two women. Yeah. So, sorry, continue. Just go, Mary. Yeah. Um, I was interested in the lady. Um, because where she came from, you know, she's had a lot of the stuff in her believes, you know, mm -hmm. that, that something maybe God had planned her to change her life. And then not only that, she could have loved Naomi, her husband, a lot because she learned to love his, his, his mother and care for his mother. And also, too, what kind of family that she grew up in. And they might have loved her, too, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, even in a family like that with a bad um, uh, culture and all that, there could be good people too. Sure. So I just think that that, mm -hmm. that love was a, a developing from the beginning and it just couldn't be broken up. And she had the compassion for his, her, his, her mother in law. Sure. Duan, did you have something? Uh, I attended a Parkinson's disease seminar Friday and uh, came away with a, a couple of observations. You know, that's a, a tragic disease. There's, we don't know what causes it. We don't uh, have really good treatment for it. We do have some treatment with medications and or the heroes or the, the caregivers of the, the spouse that has Parkinson's. But it's a, a, a progressive disease and some just become very rigid in body and, but the comment of one of the speakers was that of the group in the auditorium, they were the most upbeat, cheerful, uh, thinking people who were afflicted with this terrible disease. Mm. And of course, one of the big problems is, is walking as this disease goes along. And uh, I saw Jim Schuen walking down the hall this morning, and he said because of 21 years in the Army, 
he walks like this. <laughs> and the point is, if we have balance problems, if we will just swing our arms, we will be less likely to fight. That's more British for me. I swing, I fall. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see um, next week when Ruth and Naomi come up with the plan of uh, how to uh, provide for themselves. They send out, well, Ruth is sent out into the fields to glean because, of course, uh, the, the law says you're not to, if, I don't have, there's a certain amount that if it falls onto the ground and you're not to pick it up because that is what is there for the widows and the beggars and the the orphans, the, the weak who cannot take care of themselves so that they may come back behind the, uh, the harvesters and pick up the grain and so they can provide for themselves so no one goes hungry. You had your hand up. I, I just think one thing that the Old Testament or the whole Bible that we kind of get robbed from and it's the greatest book of the world but we, we have no concept of time and we have no concept of distance don't necessarily know where all these locations are. Um, I just looked up what's the estimate distance between Moab and Bethlehem. Well, it's 75 miles. So this isn't a small feat. Um, we don't know how old they are, but um, also taking back, and so, like, Ruth and them, they don't have kids, so they might not have been married very long. We don't know how these three men died. Did they all die in a battle? Like, so they all died in a time? Or, you know, was it years and years and years. So I, that's just fun to say. But to piggyback on you, when you were saying like Ruth, I mean, uh, Naomi felt like maybe she's a burden. Maybe it wasn't that she felt Ruth was a burden. Maybe she felt like she was the burden on Ruth. Like, like I'm the one that's going to be back. You, know, you have, all, you have, you're younger, you have this life ahead of you. And if you stick with me, what, what's, what's your future going to be other than being just my caretaker or my, you know? But they might have been really young. Sure. You know. Just to look at the map, take a look at the map today. The distance between major cities, that's about a day's journey by foot. Yeah. That's if you're keeping up the, the constant pace the whole time. You're not stopping, you're not eating, you're not eating. Drinking water, you're not carrying all your worldly possessions. Yeah, <laughs> there's not this big uh, sea in between you. <laughs> it's on the other side of the, the sure. sea. Sure. Like, and so it probably wasn't just a, oh yeah, it's it's no big deal. It's it's clearly going to be a long and arduous trip, and I'm sure it's a dangerous trip too. Not only because of the terrain, but they are two women traveling alone along this road, it, it probably isn't foreign if uh, that there would be bandits on roads if, I don't know, Jesus gives a parable and everyone seems to understand what he's talking about. No one's saying, a bandit uh, along the road? Like, the bandits aren't along the road. No, bandits are along the road. This is probably a more traveled road uh, than not, because why would you want to take the back roads if that's just going to add more time to a walk? Like, it's not out for our Sunday drive. No, you are clearly walking everywhere. Um, but uh, we have time for probably a few more comments uh, or questions. But kind of makes me wonder about Ruth's faith, where she was. Yeah. She had to be willing and accepted of where she was, whether she knew very much or not, or the example of her, sure. her husband. That they were in a country where Yahweh wasn't worshipped no. so I mean could there have been conflicts could there have been areas of okay this is what I know but this is how I don't know very much of 
Yeah. And so she had to definitely have some kind of faith to go that direction into an, another world. Yeah. And I think that kind of goes back to that idea of not only Naomi, but surely these men that died were teaching or representing God and how they acted, how they lived their life. Clearly there is something different about them than the Moabites, right? Well, and we can even jump back into the Exodus. There isn't really a huge difference between the Israelites and the Egyptians towards the time of the Exodus because they've been there for so long they have forgotten what they're supposed to do with God. They, they have just become Egyptians who circumcise themselves and look like Jews instead of Egyptians. They don't look the same, and so that's why they're outside. They, they no longer live like Israelites. Well, we could also argue, well, they don't have the law. They, don't, they haven't been taught how to be Israelites. They don't, haven't been taught how to be godly people. But this time, surely, well, they've gone back into, they've, this is after the conquest, so they've established the, the, the nation of Israel. You, the, you have your tribes. The teaching of the law has been returned to the land. Joshua has spent time and time again spending time teaching the people the law, writing the law down, setting up markers and memorials to remind the people of who they are, who this God they serve is, what all of this is going. So this is probably a generation, two generations later. Surely these uh, Elimelech and his two sons have been taught the law. They, they live a godly life following God amongst the Moabites who this law seems foreign to. Because it is. That they don't, why should I care for my neighbor and do all these things of, well, if my neighbor's animal crosses into my land and falls down a well, why should I care if the animal gets returned to my neighbor or not? Why should I care if my neighbor loses a, a, a sheep uh, and uh, when he's out taking them to pasture? Why should I care about that? Let me care about my stuff. I, I don't worry about my neighbor. Well, the law is built upon the principle of love God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and spirit, um, and then love your neighbor as yourself. That is what the law is built upon. And it's not necessarily verbatim that way in the Old Testament, but as you go through the, the Levitical law and the Deuteronomy's recounting of the law, it circles those points again and again and again and so just by the way they live they i think again there has to be something that that's showing uh ruth and orpa that this god is something d different now orpa is not super convinced of yeah this is what i need to hitch my life into but ruth is ruth recognizes that as this is what i need to be following this is a lifestyle Yes, ma'am. Um, Ruth was married to one of his sons, mm -hmm. and the husband must have taught Ruth about God. And then this, the work that she put, the risk that she put to be with Naomi and give her life, you know? And I think that she learned that by her husband. Sure. And I thought that was a beautiful love and commitment, and she, she, she just loved her a lot. But I think that she learned some things from her husband. Yeah, exactly. Um, to wrap this up, um, I didn't bring this up last week because we had three chapters to try and get through. But as we have been trying to do, I, I want to end the class on kind of a, a parallel. What are what are the choices that are being that, that our characters in the Bible are being faced with? And I think it's pretty easy to see. Orpah and Ruth are faced with the same choice. And it's, do I continue with Naomi, or do I not? Do I return to my people, or do I go and live amongst God's people? And at this point, you, you don't know what the results are going to be. I think of that poem by Robert Frost, uh, 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 the, the, I, 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 I can't recite it all, but it's basically uh, two paths diverge in a, a meadow wood. One seems to be a nice easy going straightforward path to the, it's not dark there's the sun the, the wheat field on one side it seems to be leading to a city and then there's one that takes you down to the deep dark forest and 
it's dim and there's roots everywhere. It's uh, clearly not the easy path forward. And that's kind of all we get about the description. We don't know what path the, the author takes. He, he doesn't say he took the one that looks nice. He didn't say he went on the one that looked hard. He didn't say which how the results ended up. He didn't say, well, if I went down the easy path, it led to actually destruction, or it actually led to blessing like it looked. He didn't say that the, the path that was hard and took him down through the forest was the right way or the wrong way. He just says that the path he took made all the difference. And I think the same thing is happening with Ruth and Orpah. Well, he, there's two paths. One's the easy way. I'm going to return to my family, to my gods, to my culture. But we ultimately know the Moabites are destroyed. Uh, they face destruction. They are punished for the wickedness, the sinfulness of, of their culture is poured out against them. And many of them are destroyed. This story shows the love and providence God has for widows. Yes. I'm not that. <laughs> But Jeff, go. Uh, going with Robert Frost, it says two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, <coughs> and that made all the difference. So that's that's the road less traveled is the one he took. Sure. And you would assume that's why he's writing it. He didn't have to actually do it. He yeah. wrote it and made it sound real good. Yeah. But for Ruth, she takes probably the path that. If anyone else was in that situation, would not take it. It is the path less traveled. It does not seem easy. It doesn't seem to be the path that would make a whole lot of sense at first. You, you, you have to, to, to walk 75 miles and go live amongst people you have no idea who are, who are going to outcast you and recognize, hey, you're not like us. You're the Moabite. Even in the writing of Ruth, it's over and over again, Ruth the Moabite, Ruth of Moab. The daughter-in-law from Moab is over and over and over and over again. And so it's not an easy decision. But often we get this, we have the same thing that happens to us. Um, but thank you guys.